Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis 3. Uh, tonight we are looking at uh, biblical manhood. The world needs it. Uh, in our series, The Family Foundation, that we've been looking through in sort of the, it's a mini-series, uh, if you will, inside of the creation. You know, last week we looked at what the Lord joined together there in the garden when the Lord instituted something special called marriage. Tonight we're going to look at the biblical manhood and who God created man to be. Now listen, the world that you and I live in, the book that y you and I look to many times do not align together. Uh, the world's worldview does not align a lot of times with a biblical worldview. So how do we live for Christ in this dark world? I mean, well, we got to go back to the Bible. We have to go back to the beginning. Now, people say the church only exists, I said this last week, to preach the gospel. And we need to preach the gospel. The Bible's also true about everything it speaks to. And we need to understand that. If we don't stand on the bedrock of these foundational truths, then how do people know that they can trust the Bible and what it says about everything else? If we don't, even the gospel, if we don't stand on this. So man in a fallen world, Adam and Eve have blown it. This is where we're going to pick up the story. They've blown it in a big way, by the way. <laughs> they had paradise. They've sinned for the first time, and now that they've sinned, it won't be the last time for mankind. It continues on in every person born through the lineage of Adam and Eve, which that's all of us. We'll be born with a sinful nature, but that's not the end, though. God in his goodness covers Adam and Eve. We're going to see that. Lays out uh, biblical, God-honoring man and woman responsibilities and roles for each one of them. So tonight we will look at manhood next week, uh, Lord willing, if we're still here. He didn't rapture us back home, and I'm all right if that's what happens. Um, but if we're here next week, we'll talk about biblical womanhood. I mentioned something last week about my friend Rat uh, on, the, on, the, on the potter's wheel. And we were talking about the molding and shaping, and that the clay didn't get a chance to dictate what it become. I want us to realize and keep in mind whose hand we are in and being shaped as God's, okay? And so if you're physically able, I'd ask you to stand as we read Genesis 3. We're going to be in verses 17 through 24 this evening. Biblical manhood, the world needs it. Beginning there in 17, it says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. Oh, he's about to get introduced to thorns and thistles. Shall bring forth for, for you, you shall eat of the herb of the field, and in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, from out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and the dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living things. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunic of skin, clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now let him, let he be put out, uh, put his hand, and take also... Let me start over. And now lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, the east gate. There and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, we know that the world is pressing in upon both women and men when it comes to roles, responsibilities, who we've been created to be. God, I pray you'd speak to the hearts of men tonight, but Lord, also to the hearts of women to understand the roles and responsibilities of a man. And God, that we as men would 
listen and heed your word and become all that you desire and designed us to be. The world needs it, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. A simple takeaway. The Lord is honored when men live out their biblical manhood. Now, according to the Bible and by the example of Christ, masculinity, I read this in an article. It's, all, it's really good. Masculinity is humble leadership. It's sacrificial love and incredible meekness. But meekness isn't weak. Meekness is power harnessed in the right way. And so our society needs a revitalized masculinity. We were born to be masculine men. Y'all all right? We were born to be masculine. So the first thing that we, we look at here, there's three things that I believe the text shows us. And the first one is biblical manhood includes leading. Now, then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife. Now, culture would use words like toxic. They don't want men to be men. The most beautiful expression of God's creation in the context of man and women is masculine men and feminine women. But it all started, why do I start with the man instead of dealing with the serpent or even the woman? Because man is who God created to lead. And the order in which he created. Now, before we get started... <clears throat> This ain't to blame or indict man for every problem that ever came into this world. The world's doing a really good job of that, so I don't need to add to that. Matter of fact, especially if you look, and I'm just going to say it, if you're a conservative, Christian, God-loving, and God-honoring man, uh, you are the problem according to this world. But can I tell you, you're not the problem. You're actually the solution. Uh, it's because God designed us lead. I read an article, another article this week. It, you can't make this stuff up. This article says that literally the patriarchal family, a god a god a godly man leading his family, the patriarchal model of a family. Okay, I read this article. This writer says comes out of white supremacy. <laughs> Can I just say this? It ain't a white thing. It ain't a black thing. It ain't a yellow or red thing. It's a God thing. Patriarchal family model is a God thing. And you have these folks trying to say that because uh, the, 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 the teaching of a patriarchal family where God's man is leading in a godly way, it comes out of white supremacy. It did not. It comes straight out of the garden. It's amazing, these people's teaching. And this stuff's being pressed upon young people left and right. It's crazy. It ain't a white thing. It's a God thing. But at this very moment in Scripture is where things go sideways for humanity. Eve's choice brought a curse on her, but Adam's choice brought a curse on all humanity. Why? Because Adam is the federal head of the human race. Romans 5.12 tells us that. Therefore, just as though one man's sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin, it came through Adam. When, he, when they sinned and they went and hid, God didn't call for Eve. He said, Adam, where are you? See, in theology, federal headship is, 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 is used to explain sort of imputation, imputation, how Adam's sin was imputed to all his descendants and how Christ's righteousness was imputed to those who believed the gospel. So according to the federal headship theory or federalism, Adam was the federal or, or representative head of the human race. And so the great failure of Adam, listen, the great failure of Adam, it was, I know this ain't going to be popular, but it's true was that he listened to his wife here. Now, I'm not saying you ain't never supposed to listen to your wife. Sometimes we do. Sometimes they, they help us. All right? But this is about listening and heeding Eve's counsel that was against God's will. He did exactly what God told him not to do. God said, don't eat of that. Don't eat of the tree. And Adam said, I think I'll try it. 
Why? Because Eve gave it to him. He listened to his wife. That's what the Bible says. He heeded the voice of his wife because the voice was against God's will in this particular manner. Biblical manhood. Man is positioned to lead. Why? Because it comes from the mind and the mouth of God. He says it right here. Men, we are to lead in a way that promotes God's will. And just for the record's sake, this will always be in alignment with his word. So it meant when we promote God's will, don't try to promote something that's self-made up. It's got to align with God's word. So men are to lead in ways that point men and women to the Lord. Now, the great controversy is here is, her, is, is the phrase, her, her husband with her. When you look at the scripture, it says that he was with her. Now, was Adam there the whole time that the enemy was deceiving Eve? Or did he come in a little later, maybe, uh, and, and Eve gave it? I, I, not sure, which is actually the scenario, because I wasn't there. <laughs> Here's what I do know. Maybe he was there the whole time, or maybe he just comes in a little later, and his wife offers him the fruit. But either way, Adam had the opportunity to honor the Lord, and he didn't. That's the fact. So Adam was accountable. Now, this is all about leading. He's accountable. Listen, Adam didn't lead his wife back to God. He just ran with her. He went with her. He said, well, he, he, she says this, and I know what God says, but I'm just going to go with her. He didn't lead, and he didn't protect her. I want you to listen, guys. God has given us authority. The world doesn't want us to say that, but God has given us authority. But with it comes accountability. One of the toughest tests, one of the toughest positions we may find ourselves in is when someone we love tempts us to join them in sin. No matter who that person is, in this case, it was his wife. No matter who the person is, you are ultimately accountable to God before anybody else. That's why I get troubled when I hear mamas and daddies tell their kids, you know, oh, I just want you to be happy. Can I remind everyone this evening? Nowhere in Scripture, nowhere does it say God says we are, our, our purpose is to be happy. Nowhere. And y'all heard me say this before. If it ever comes down between me going with, going with Jesus or Tam, Tam's going to be by. She's she going to be alone in that one. Every comes down. Listen, it don't matter if my, Tammy, my mama, my kids, my brothers. Every single time I'm rolling with Jesus. Every time. Now, that might get you in a hot spot with them. But I can promise you, ain't nothing hotter than the discipline of the Lord. You need to write that. There ain't nothing hotter than the discipline of the Lord. Them spiritual spankers from the Lord ain't no joke. Trust me. I've been spanked a time or two by him. So we're to lead. Listen, men are to lead. We've been gifted and skilled by God. And not only that, we've been called by him to lead. We need to lead people toward the Lord. Now, I want to mention this last thing before we go to the next thing. It's significant. Guys, we always want to lead in multiple things. We want to be the best on the team. We want to be the biggest big shot with money earned. We want to be uh, the big shot when it comes to position achieved. Uh, we have an image-driven agenda sometimes. But the most important way that we can lead is leading people to Jesus Christ because only eternal things will matter in eternity. So we need to be able to lead in a fashion that has eternity in mind. But we're called to lead. We're called to lead. That's biblical manhood, leading. Leading. We're going, to get, we're going to come back around to that and flesh it out in just a little bit. I'm going to put some legs on it so you can walk out of here with it. All right. Biblical manhood includes leading. It includes laboring as well. It talks about cursed is the ground and from the dust you are and to the dust you shall return. Now, God starts out here that Adam's going to have to work. 
That's one of his responsibilities. Go back to Genesis 1, 26. It didn't just start here. Works, work's been since, since, since he created uh, uh, man. Look at uh, 26. Uh, it says, uh, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our own likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish in the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. We have dominion and rule over. So work started then. Uh, as you read through the scriptures, you see the presumption that work is just a part of our responsibilities, guys. Solomon continues this idea of work all through Ecclesiastes. We are built to work. Listen, that's why a man's physical making is different than a woman's. Because we're supposed to do things that women can't do when it comes to work. I mean, but here we're tends to make sure we see man's work was holy before the fall. Still holy, by the way. We, we ought to honor the Lord when we work. But in the enterprise of work, man is able to go out in the environment, all that God's created, interact with the God-given skills and design, and he's able to rule over creation. That's pretty important. Have you ever thought about this? Even God, I said this this morning in the Sunday school class, even God worked in the first six days of creation. Now, he didn't work too hard, I don't think, because he just spoke and everything came to existence. But he worked. It was a, it's, it's a, it's a, an idea that we get from the text that we are supposed to labor and work. And then he rested on the seventh day. Now, God's honored when we work with the mentality that is holy, uh, that we do our work as if we're doing it for the Lord. I tell people all the time, look, I, I work for the Lord. Keurig pays me, but I work for the Lord. Every morning I wake up, I don't say, well, you know what, Keurig, I, I don't know if I'm going to work for them. I'm, I'm a little upset with them, or I think I'm going to work really, really hard and work all night long because I like them. And I, I get up and say, I got a job to do, and I want to honor God in it. And so uh, when we work that way, uh, God's honored. Biblical manhood is contrary to the world's idea of manhood. Now, our modern idea in America is pushing man towards self-promotion or self-indulgence. Some men pour themselves into their work so much that their family suffers. I've seen this over my career. I've seen men hold work at its highest priority and everything else falls in line behind it. It's why when I first, I remember when I first started with Keurig, uh, one, of my, one of my bosses he said, Terry, I just want to give you a heads up. Half this team's divorced. I said, well, I'm going to let you know. I won't be adding to that statistic. I literally told him, I said, I'll leave before that happens. <laughs> I'll leave with Gary. He said, well, I'm glad to hear that because he was one of the ones that wasn't. But I've seen guys hold work in an unhealthy position. On the flip side of things, I've seen guys run from work. They just lazy. You know what I'm talking about? And Mr. Carlos is shaking his head. I bet you've seen some too, brother. You've, you've, you've employed a lot of people over the years. I bet you've seen some laziness. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll avoid work as much as they can. Interesting, God rested on the seventh day because he worked hard six days. It's hard to rest from resting. It's hard to rest from resting. <laughs> but now, listen, our work shouldn't become an idol, but it shouldn't be the hate and the necessity of livelihood either. I'm thankful for my job. God's provided me for it, with it. should be satisfying in a balanced way to where it provides for the family but doesn't give ground for pride or greed. Now, after the fall, work went from holy to hard. The Lord curses the ground. Now man will have to work by the sweat of his brow. Toil. That word toil, when you translate it in the original language, the root means physical pain and emotional sorrow. Adam went from paradise, working and seeing everything just work just perfectly, to now he's got to deal with some things as he's introduced to, thorns and thistles. I told the, the Sunday school class this morning, you know anybody here like blackberries? Amen. Y'all ever pick blackberries? Man, when I get to heaven, I don't see Adam. Man, I got pricked still in my fingers because of you. Blackberries, you should not have them thorns on them. This farmer is about to be introduced to thorns and thistles. And these thorns and thistles are a reminder that man's the one that made the work hard. 
not God. He gave us paradise. It wasn't the Lord's idea for man to rebel. It was hard. Even when you look at Lamech in in Genesis 5 on over. uh, He lived 182 years and he had a son. His son was Noah. And this is what Lamech said. This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Adam had paradise. Now the work would get hard. But we need to, 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 to do it as if we're working for the Lord no matter how hard it gets. It's good to be tired, by the way, when you work. It's good to be tired. You know why? So you can go home and get some rest. You're too tired to go out and get involved in ungodly things. See, if you work real hard all day, then you ain't got, you'll be too tired. You'll be wanting to rest. You won't have energy to go out and get involved in stuff that maybe you shouldn't be involved in. We ought to be serving, laboring for the Lord in everything we do. Serving, that, that idea. In the paradigm of the husband and wife, uh, the husband and wife uh, is Christ in the church, that picture there. Could I ask you all this, this evening, who serves more, Christ or the church? Christ, by far, because he served perfectly. Well, if that's the picture in between husband and wife, guys, who, are, who should be serving more? Just going to throw it out there. Who should be setting the example of serving? We need to labor and serve the Lord. Um, now, I want you to understand, sometimes, sometimes people can't work. Sometimes there's illness or injury. Sometimes you just can't catch a break. You're trying and trying and trying, just can't catch a break. That's not what I'm talking about here. When it comes to people that don't want to work or don't work honoring the Lord. We are called and made to work and serve the Lord. And so if you're not serving Him in everything you do. Then you're not God honoring when it comes to being a biblical man. Serve the Lord. And so you see, we are supposed to lead, we're supposed to labor, now we're supposed to love. Now here's where we're really going to get into some good stuff. Now listen, we need to be covered by the Lord. We are not going to lead well, we're not going to labor well, and we certainly aren't going to love well if we are not covered by the Lord. In verse 21 he says, also for Adam and Eve, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Now listen, on your own you will never properly cover what your sin uncovers. So now this is a picture of redemption here. Not sure what kind of animal it was. I've heard people say, well, it was a lamb. It was a goat. I don't know which one it was, but I know this. To get the skin off the animal, the life had to come out of the animal. God had to kill it to get the garments to cover Adam and Eve. The animal wasn't guilty. He wasn't a guilty one. It didn't eat the fruit that was forbidden. So the death of, an, of the innocent for the guilty. The death of the innocent for the guilty. Here is God causing their wrong to fall on one that had done no wrong. This is a picture of Christ. And we need to be covered in that. If we're going to lead well, if we're going to labor well, and certainly if we're going to love well. Now, God's response to our rebellion is he put us out of the garden. He put them out. The grace of God. God could have folded up shop, scrubbed the human project right then, but he didn't. He drove them out. And by the way, that was love demonstrated by God. I won't get into it tonight, but if Adam, look, there was a tree of life there, and God said, he, if he eats from that, if Adam had eaten from the tree of life, he would have lived for eternity and locked himself in a place of lostness. And so God says, I'm going to cast him out of the garden. Not only does that, he then puts a cherubim and a a burning sword that's that's twirling basically all the way on every side so nobody can get back in. Do you know there's people still looking for the garden now? They're trying to find out where it was, where it is. 
The reason we hadn't found the garden is because the Lord locked us out of it. And we don't need to find the place where we fail anyway. We need to find the, the place of forgiveness is where we need to find. And that's given at Calvary where there was another tree of life. Where the blood of Jesus Christ was shed to cover our sin, to give us redemption from our sin. We need the covering of the Lord. We need his lordship and his leadership, men. And so Jesus showed us how to love. Let me ask this question. What would happen if men in the church, worldwide, the Lord's church, learned to love in a biblical manhood way? You think anything would change? I think a lot would change. Jesus showed the way. Love Jesus first. For us, it's love Jesus first. Love others and then love myself. Now you say, Terry, do you really need to love yourselves? That sounds contrary to the Bible. Well, I, when I say love yourself, I'm not talking about a selfish love that puts yourself above all others. I'm talking about loving who the Lord made you. You're made in the image of God exactly the way he desired. I've said that multiple times. I'm going to say it multiple times next week. Your identity is in who Christ made you to be, not in what somebody thinks about you. Tammy tells people all the time, Terry's pretty secure in his own skin. He's secure in who God made him. See, I said I'm going to put legs on this thing tonight so we can walk out these principles in everyday life. How we think about ourselves. The world has a view and God has a view and a version of man. Before I get into this, let me ask you a question. Who is shaping your thoughts tonight on what biblical manhood is? Who's shaping them? If God's not the one shaping them, then start listening to him and stop listening to whoever is shaping them. The chief expression of God's very nature is in the word father. Not mother, not brother, father. Now we know God's spirit, but God chose to reveal himself as father. That's what he chose. And if we don't start teaching and standing firm on biblical manhood and masculinity, we're going to get to it. People aren't going to even know how the Lord designed man. That's why the world is constantly right now trying to redefine what God's already defined. He's try, they're trying to redefine marriage. They're trying to redefine life. Now they're trying to redefine womanhood and manhood. The chief expression God uses is father. Did y'all know that upsets a lot of people? Especially women. I just tell them, don't get upset with me. Get upset with God. He's the one that wrote it. And he wrote it for a reason. It's the way he ordered it. We're supposed to lead. So what is the lasting damage to a world where the man isn't what the Lord designed? Fatherless families. That's the lasting damage. I'm thankful for God-honoring women, but can I just say this? There's some things God-honoring women cannot do. We need to love one another. We need to love like Jesus loved. We need to love our wives. We need to love our kids. We need to love the family of God. Because if we belong to the Lord, we'll love like he did. Look, here's something to ponder. I'm going to say this, and then you think of yourself. Just put your, your, your names in this. Tammy's not just my wife. She's not just the mama of my kids. She's my sister in Christ. Ponder that for a minute, guys. This is who we've been made to be. To love in a manner... That only we can do to have the impact that God wants us to have. What the world needs more than ever is biblical men living out biblical manhood. I'm going to give you a few, few words and we'll close up here in just a moment. 
Husband, father, head. Husband, father, head. I'm going to turn over here to Ephesians real quick. Ephesians 5, if you're taking notes, just write Ephesians 5, 25 through 33 down. Let me read that real quick, and then I'm going to read a couple of other verses. Ephesians 5, 25 through 33. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church, gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, uh, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is the greater mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, that's the husband, the father, Ephesians 6, 4. Ephesians 6, 4, and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And then the head, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to turn over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Now, verse 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Man is the head. It's the way God designed it. And if he is the head, and he's the father and he's the husband, then God honors that. Now look, we hear these words and we know their intent and the weight that are carried and the responsibility. There's three other words in Scripture that the Bible speaks in the context of manhood that mirror some way this husband, father, head. Let me give it to you. Priest, prophet, and king. Every married man here, every man here that maybe want to, want to be married someday, every man here that may not ever be married, I want you to still listen because this is our role. The role we play in the context of home, priest. What did the priest do? They brought people through worship before God. You bring your family before the Lord in worship. That's our job. Bring our family before the Lord to worship. I wrote this statement down. You will not be, more, more, you will not be a more biblical man staying away from church. I ain't never seen it. You will not be a more biblical man staying away from church. You won't. I've never seen one that stays away from church become more godly. Never seen it. I've seen a whole bunch that stayed away from the church and become less godly. Priest brought people through worship before God. Guys, that's our role. It's a responsibility and an extraordinary. Look at this spider right here. He just met his maker. <laughs> I saw it. Didn't you see it? It's right there. It was distracting me. Jan's still over there laughing. He did. Anyway, priest, prophet. What does the prophet do? Bring the word down from God to the people. This morning we talked about a Philippian jailer. He left home that, 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 that evening uh, to go uh, uh, do what he does as a jailer. Took his lunchbox to work with him like he normally did. To be hard on the prisoners, probably beat them up as well. But something changed on that particular shift we saw this morning. He is gloriously saved. He took Paul and Silas home, cleaned them up. His whole family, look, took them to his whole family. And I'm sure them kids and the wife were scratching their head like, what in the world is going on with daddy? He normally comes home and brags about how, how he beat them folks up. He brought them to the house and now he's cleaning them up. 
The whole house gets saved because the gospel is shared and the Lord uses the change in their daddy to give evidence of the goodness of God and the gospel. The jailer brought God's men and God's message to his family. He brought God's word into his house. That's who we are, guys. We need to be the ones bringing God's word to the family. Don't depend on a preacher to do it. Listen, I love your families, and I'm here for you in any way I can to help you grow in the Lord and to know the Lord. But it ain't my responsibility to lead your household. It's yours. That might sting, but that's all right. It's the way God set it up. And look, if, if, you, if you don't feel equipped yet or you don't feel like, man, I don't know the Bible well enough, just make sure you get them here. And when you get them here, we're going to teach both of you. And then eventually you'll be able to journey together. And eventually you will be equipped to do it all well at your house. You know, the table is for things, right? It's for eating and talking to each other. I'll tell you what the table's not for, watching TV, playing on the phone or iPad. But there's something else the table could be used for. Bible reading and devotionals. Don't knock it till you try it. But I want to get to this king thing. This is good. Man, we kings, guys. We kings. We kings. Let's go back to the head. Leader. This is who God made us to be. We're kings. And all of us got a palace. Lead your families. Now, I know what some of you is already thinking. Terry, you're leaving the women out. Yeah, I am. I am. You know why? Because they ain't supposed to be leading. We'll get to the ladies next week in their role. Leading ain't one of them. Not the home. Now, I praise God for all single mothers out there that's having to do both jobs. But that ain't the way the Lord set it up. It might, be pop, it might, it might not be popular, but it's true. God set it up for the man to lead his family. A job a woman was never meant to do. Here's another thing. If she tries to be the leader to wear the pants and the skirt, it won't work. It will not work. Y'all know how I know that it won't work? No matter the intention, by the way. Latest statistics don't lie. 92% of the time. 90, let that statistic sink in real quick. 92% of the time. When a man leads his family and household in a godly fashion, the family follows. 92% of the time. When mama leads, it's roughly 20. Is there a reason that the statistic is so skewed? Absolutely. It ain't in order. God set it up in a particular way. The number one things that help kids, well, I wrote this down. The number one thing that helps kids walk with Jesus is watching their parents, specifically their daddy, love and walk with Jesus. So, guys, if you want to encourage your family to walk with the Lord, show them how. Show them how. This world has tried to strip masculinity out. And we're reaping the fruit of the seeds that's been sown. We are masculine. We need to be masculine. We need to act masculine. We need to look masculine. And we need to lead masculine. We need to labor with masculinity. We need to love in a masculine way. My daughter jokes with, with Griff sometimes. Me and Griff will get to talking. Tammy's already laughing. 
they'll get to talking and we're going to finish up. And she'll, she'll, she'll look over there and she'll be laughing at that, that Tammy and she'll look and she goes, look, look, look. Two alpha males. I said, and that's okay. That's okay. I'm glad that Griff's got a little alpha male in him. It's one of the things I love about him. I prayed, to, I prayed to the Lord a long time ago. Lord, whoever you have for Taylor, just make sure they're masculine. Make sure they know they're a man and proud of it. He did me good. <laughs> he did me good. He did. Thank you, Lord. He did me good. It's funny, but in a way, it's really not. I wouldn't want my daughter with a man that's not comfortable with who God made him to be. I'm glad Griff's securing his own skin. You know why I say that? Because if he's securing his own skin, my daughter will be secure with him. Y'all all right? It's good stuff. Living in a fallen world, you know what we're missing? Masculinity. I'll give you this statistic and we're going to close up. 70% of kids, this is heartbreaking. Y'all want to know why the world's tore up from the floor up? Right here. 70% of kids are born without a father in the home. Latest statistic. Seven out of ten for y'all that are struggling with math. Seven out of ten kids born without a father in the home. Listen, we don't just need to know what biblical manhood is. We need to walk it out, guys. We need to walk it out. We need to walk it out in front of our wives, our kids, our family, our friends. The world needs masculine men. More than ever, they need God-designed, godly men. Amen. Well, thank you for tuning in and listening to this online message from Living Water Baptist Church. We hope you've been encouraged and challenged. We at Living Water believe that every time God's word is preached, it demands a response. Jesus reminds us in Matthew 7, 24, that everyone who hears his words and does them will be like a person who built their house on a solid foundation. So if there's a decision you know of that you need to make in response to this message, would you let us know by emailing us at decision at lwbctriad.org? Whether it's the need to repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you need to follow through on your salvation and be baptized, or you want to join our faith family here at Living Water through church membership, or you simply need us to pray for you. Whatever the need, we want to hear from you. So please email us at decision at lwbctriad.org so that we can better minister to you. For more information about Living Water Baptist Church, be sure to visit us online. You can check out our website at www.lwbctriad.org or you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash lwbctriad. Well, God bless you. Thanks again for joining us online, and we hope to see you in person this coming Sunday.